One of the first things I was really intrigued about the conference, because again, I'm new to the conference and I'm just giving a chance to kind of touch base with the evolution of this whole movement, is the kids. Um, we have a big annual conference. I'll tell you more about the kind of work that I've been directly involved with, Jamie and I kind of jointly helping to co-found a network of schools. Um, and one of our criteria is that every meeting we have, our goal is a quarter of the people there are students. And partly that came from when I first would start to get around educators. I would go to all these conferences of teachers and superintendents and state superintendents, doesn't really matter what level, and I never saw any students. And, and I would ask people, like, well, where are the students? And they'd go, huh? Oh, we had a panel. We had a student on one of those panels. And it was like, a, what, what is, why are you asking this question? You know, again, coming from someone who's worked a lot in the world of business, I thought, well, this is kind of like you have one golden rule in business. Your golden rule is you should never, ever, ever talk to a customer. As long as you follow that golden rule, you're okay. Now, the students aren't really exactly the same as customers in business. But they're kind of analogous. In a sense, they're the folks why we're doing what we're doing. And so that kind of became really annoying to me. You know, why the hell are the kids? How do we know what's working or what's not? How do we know we're on the right track if the kids aren't directly involved? But gradually, as these two threads started to come together, the need to kind of reinvent education on the one hand, the need for fundamental innovation in how we teach and what we teach and what a school looks like, how it's built, what the environment's like. You know, if you walk in just physically to some of the schools that are being built here and other places, and you walk into a school that was built 50 years ago, you know, it's a big difference. You feel very differently. And this imperative to deal with food, water, energy, waste, and toxicity, and the growing gap between rich and poor. I would say, from my standpoint, the big headline is really simple. Guess who will lead this transformation? And it's always fun for me, because I've seen this now for about five years since we've been doing our annual conference, People always come away and they go, well, well, this was great, and we did this systems education, uh, systems thinking workshop, and that was wonderful, and I did a, a program uh, with a bunch of superintendents about systems principles for leadership, the kind of thing that Aaron was starting to talk about. Oh, and I hung out with people like Tim, and that was really cool, but the kids, they always say the same thing. The kids are amazing. I can't believe how thoughtful they are. I can't believe how dedicated they are, how intelligent they are, how much they understand the challenges of the world. And I always say the same thing. The only thing that's really surprising here is why are you surprised? <laughs> because obviously you haven't spent much time with many kids. This generation of young people, children, students, young adults, is unique in history because for the first time they are growing up in the world. Not as a euphemism, but as a lived experience. Children always grow up in their context, in their community, in their village, in wherever, in their family, obviously. But today kids have a pretty good feeling of what the hell is going on in the world. They see the imbalances. Sadly, they see very few visible images of real leadership. They see a lot of images of leadership which aren't so good. And of course, we know how our mass media work and the distributed media really aren't much better in a lot of ways, but they're more varied. That's a good thing. But most of what comes across in all the media, uh, are, the public media, are stories of violence, stories of corruption, unethical behavior. If it's not bad, it's not news. That's kind of the way our news media has evolved over the last 30 or 40 years. If it's not sensational, it's not news. But we all know that. And of course, the kids are immersed in that. But they're also very aware because they can walk down the street. They can look outside. They realize that was a beautiful place that's not beautiful anymore. They see a strip mall where a forest used to be, whatever. They, they can feel it. My experience is kids are acutely aware 
of the deep imbalances that exist in our present way of living. And they know they're global. Of course, we have our own unique problems in Virginia Beach, in the United States, in North America, but they also know they're global. They have this awareness of the world in a state of profound imbalance, whether it's social or environmental or economic. Look at the biggest economic problem in the world, and a lot of kids sense this, and a lot of them know the facts, is youth unemployment. There are countries, even in, quote, highly developed places like Europe, where 50% of the young people do not have jobs. That's a huge economic problem. And of course, it's a huge social problem. Guess where all the recruits for all the terrorist organizations come from? Not the organizers, the recruits. Unemployed young people with no prospect of employment. Kids are aware of this problem. Obviously, they're aware of climate destabilization. <laughs> I have about three feet of snow in my front yard. I keep telling people I have a deeper base than most of the Colorado ski areas. Yeah, I think it's cool because I like to go skiing every day and we live on a lake and I take off my doorstep, so that's really neat. But I understand for a lot of people it's, it's not so cool. And, and no, everybody has their story like that. You can go any place in the world and people will tell you their story of the weather is different. The birds come at a different time. Birds that used to show up don't show up anymore. The seeds are coming up too early. And, and while I think many scientists kind of rue the day that somebody came up with the term global warming because they were talking about the global mean average temperature for the planet, which of course nobody experiences, we experience local weather. When we really needed the term global weather destabilization, or as one great scientist put it, called it global weirding. Because <laughs> weather is weird. So whether we can kind of take something like that that we can all touch and feel, or we take something that's a little more distant but emotionally just as salient, the pictures of the slums and shanty towns in the developing world, and the plight of children around the world, and the extraordinary growth in permanent refugee settlement camps around the world, or the plight of our young people in the inner city in America, where for over a decade, this statistic gets debated, but it's in the ballpark, and it's enough to get us all thinking. There's been more likely for a young African-American male to end up in prison than any form of tertiary education. We have the largest prison population in America by a mile, something like about 10, about three or four million, uh, about 30, this is the simplest statistic, over 25, close to 30% of the prison inmates in America are in this country. The prison inmates in America constitute 25 to 30% of the prison inmates in the world. Excuse me, I just misstated that. And it's a huge revolving door. So what does that have to do with sustainability? What does that have to do with the health and well-being of our communities, of the opportunities that we create through our schools. So kids are very aware of the imbalances. So I think the big headline for me, very simple, and I love being in a place like this because I can feel it, is that guess who will lead the revolution? Oh, of course, it'll be teachers, and it'll be business people, and it'll be political. There's a lot of different kinds of leadership needed, obviously. It'll be moms and dads and community organizers and local church groups and so on. But you know what? At the heart of a lot of it, I believe, will be the students themselves. It is their future. It is their lives. It is not an abstraction to them. One other thing I wanted to touch on as, a, as a, just a small kind of food for thought, and because I, I suspect it's present here, but maybe hasn't been articulated quite as much. Remember my kind of basic idea that this whole green schools movement really sits at the confluence of two fundamental imperatives for modern society. One, to change how we live, the quote sustainability challenges, and the second is to change how we educate. The industrial age school, and that's the only accurate label to give it, is still the school we've got today. I mean, think about it. 
why would anybody organize a school as grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, grade five, grade six, which of course what it was originally was K, it was one to six. Why would somebody organize a school like that? Well, obviously, every child learns at the same speed, right? So they should all move in lockstep, you know, through one grade to another. Uh, that's not too good an assumption. Oh, well, it's just natural to organize your curriculum in these rigid box so that everybody should study the exact same thing at the exact same time. Oh, that's a pretty dumb idea. Or how about, ah, how will we know our schools are working? Well, we'll test them all. By the way, the standardized testing movement didn't just start in the last 10 to 20 years. It's kind of gotten amped up in the last 10, 20 years. There's a quote from 1825 from the governor of Massachusetts who said, 1825, not 1925, in which he says, our schools are failing. The answer is we must test more rigorously. If you look at the history of the industrial age school, it was modeled after the internet of its time. Here's what I mean by the internet of its time. The phenomenal innovation in how work occurred that radically revolutionized work, how work was done. From eight, 1750 to 1820, labor productivity in England rose 125 fold, not 125%. It was over 100 times greater. Why? What had happened in those intervening 75 years that totally revolutionized work? I call it the internet of its time because just as the internet kind of revolutionizes how business works today, this totally revolutionized business. What was it? Think grade one, grade two, grade three, the assembly line. The modern school, which is about 200 years old, was explicitly modeled after an assembly line. It was not an accident. It was very conscious, very intentional, and if you could put yourself in the shoes of people saying, hey, we have this growing urban population, the industrial age is really upon us, factories are here, we should have some uniform education for everybody, so what? They could go to work in the factories. School was not about education. The industrial age edu school system was much more about socialization than education. That's why they literally had bells in, on the walls to get kids used to going, you know, minute by minute, hour by hour, according to a rigid process from A to B to C to D to grade six, you're out of there and you're into the factory. Now that all seems like a long time ago, but really, if you look at how much the world, you look at how much business has changed. I spent a lot of time in modern factories. Guess what? They don't look like factories 200 years ago at all, particularly in really innovative industries. If you look at how much the world has changed, you look how much school has changed, guess what? What are you struck by? Which of the two has changed vastly less? I think in most of our school systems, we still have grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. And by the way, we still judge how kids are doing by a standardized assessment. Think about an assembly line. There's only two things that define a good assembly line. How fast is it and how uniform is it? You don't want everything coming off the assembly line to look a little different. That's a bad assembly line. And you want to maximize productivity. Guess which two imperatives are baked in to the industrial age school? Standardized assessment of, standardized assessment of learning. And if we can do it faster, it's better. And if we can do it with less productivity, with a higher productivity, that's better. So I just use this to illustrate. These are deep issues. And, and in some way, to me, they're just as critical as the sustainability issues. Because in a way, and this is what that old Chinese proverb is all about, in a way, school defines society. While business is the most powerful institution in society, nothing's even close, and we all think about government and its role, da da da, that's great, but guess what the most influential institution in terms of shaping society is? It's the institution we all encounter starting somewhere around the age of five. It's the institution that shapes our thinking. 
It's the institution that comes to define what it means to be successful. I'll never forget our young, our oldest son, when he was about seven or eight, came home from day school one day, kind of an epiphany. He said, I got it. It's about guessing what's in the teacher's head. <laughs> and every kid goes through this, because, you know, guess what? Those early years, those birth to three, four, five years before you encounter the organized system of education, they're all about learning. Human beings are born to learn. Try to keep a kid from learning. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Doesn't matter what the artifacts or the opportunities are. You cannot keep a child from learning because we are designed as a species, as master learners. And we all participate in the native, you might say, or the natural learning process, which is think of something you want to do and go figure out how to do it. And by the way, you're surrounded by others who are also learning. While walking is very individual at one level, guess what? We grow up in a community of walkers. So learning is always deeply personal and inherently collective. Both. Always. And then all of a sudden, you're plunked down in this thing called a schoolroom. And somewhere along the way, I think every kid has the same kind of epiphany our oldest son had when they realize, oh, this is different. <laughs> This is not about learning. This is not about what I want to learn to be able to do and going off and trying it and having people who help me and guide me and I watch how they did it. No, no, no. It's about sitting. It's about doing nothing. But listen. And I can't speak until I do this first. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there isn't a role for kind of these artifacts. I'm just trying to point out something that Every kid knows, and most adults have forgotten, 